Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 read as follows. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here's the male quartet to sing, Peace Like a River. Peace is flowing in my soul. Peace is flowing in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search the scriptures, God's holy word, in order to find the answers. Question number one. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, did he know beforehand she was coming? This brings us into a very interesting consideration. Jesus, the Son of God, we know that God is omniscient. He knows all. But when Jesus came into this world, there were certain aspects of his glory which were veiled for a brief time in order that he might taste of our humanity. Jesus was as fully human as though he had never been God and as fully God as though he had never been human. But this is a mystery as to exactly how all of the details, the fine print of that works out. But when we come to John chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4, we read that Jesus, along with his disciples, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. He went from the southern part of the country of Israel to the northern part. And then it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, if you wanted to be really sticky, he did not have to pass through Samaria. There was another way, a very customary way of going over to the Jordan Valley and making your way up and thereby skirting around despised Samaritan territory. However, we are given this as a clue that Jesus knew there was a need that he was to meet on this occasion. I take you to Mark chapter 1 and verse 12 as a bit of backup here. Jesus may not have known exactly the Samaritan woman and all of the details uh, before he went there. However, he was led of the Spirit in the most unmistakable way. And here in Mark chapter 1 and verse 12, early in the earliest part of his ministry, it says, immediately the Spirit impelled, the Spirit impelled Jesus to go out into the wilderness where he was tempted. Jesus was most assuredly led of the Spirit. And we have in Luke's Gospel and chapter 5, 
verse 16, but Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. There was, even in his humanity, he was leaning hard upon his heavenly Father, communing with his Father, leaning hard upon the Spirit of the living God in order to guide him and to direct him in all things, though he was unmistakably the Son of God. What exactly did Jesus know as he set out and sensing that he just had to go, had to go to Samaria? Now, we also look in the course of that conversation, there were things that Jesus most assuredly did know, and whether the Spirit was revealing as, it un as, as things unfolded, we'll need to ask in heaven about some of these things. All we can do is praise the Lord that he came in human flesh, that he might understand us all the better, and that he might die in our place, our glorious substitute. Question number two. Did Paul really write his prison epistles from a prison cell? A viewer has taken a bit of issue with me. Recently, I preached my way through the, the epistle to the Ephesian, Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, and the viewer was saying, there's no way that Paul could have written from a Roman prison cell, and the viewer directed me and reminded me of Acts chapter 28 and verse 30, that when Paul was imprisoned in Rome, from which the prison epistles were undoubtedly written, that it says, Paul stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him. Now, first of all, the prison epistles are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, and Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, and Philemon chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of that one chapter letter, we have it clearly stated that Paul was a prisoner. Now, I will grant you that perhaps he was not in the lowest dregs of the Roman prison system. He was probably not standing in mud as he was uh, an, an excrement as he was writing these letters. However, the whole point is that Paul was confined. He was a man of the open air. He was a man who delighted to move about freely. He was a man who himself was a Roman citizen and had those very special privileges to enjoy through his life. The point that I seek to make is that these indeed are written from a person who is confined. They are not their own person. Paul had given up his own freedom for the sake of the cross, but there was a double imprisonment that in that now he was a prisoner of the Roman legal system awaiting his appearance before Caesar. And though the Lord had promised to Paul that he would stand before Caesar, there was no guarantee that the outcome on the other side of that witness was going to be a good one. We are sure that Paul did, in fact, enjoy a time of freedom after that, from which there was a second imprisonment. And at that time, he wrote Second Timothy, though it's not called a prison epistle, yet it was written at the very, very end of Paul's life. And Paul was most assuredly in a much more deplorable situation as he was expecting his own death. Let me remind you in a more general way that some of the in most incredible literature has come to us from prison cells and from deathbeds and from places of the most incredibly difficult situations physically uh, and, and otherwise. And so that Paul was not able to move about 
though he may have had somewhat more comfort than the typical Roman prisoner, yet there was an uncertainty. There was a confining. He was not at his own uh, decision to do whatever he wanted. And so this is indeed what I was endeavoring to draw forth. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. Our mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Terry and Tim Sturby team up now to sing The Longer I Serve Him, and that is followed by Matt Bowring singing Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. the 
the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Sins on Jesus laid, the Lamb of God was slain. His soul was once an offering made for every soul in pain. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. You can be saved through faith alone. Justified by grace Glory to God and praise in love Be ever, ever give By saints below and saints above the church in earth and heaven. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. All of the music which you are enjoying on today's broadcast is taken from this brand new CD, Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. Many of you remark to us how that you enjoy the music of Faith to Live By, and especially that you enjoy hearing the men sing, the male quartet, as well as the duets and the solo work of our men. This CD is a response to request, let's hear more of the men. And so we have it sitting at the feet of Jesus. 14 songs to be a blessing wherever you are. Ask for it. It will be sent free in postage paid without any obligation. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Or you may call us toll free, one 833 367-3852. Also, our website, faithtoliveby.ca, is a means of you also making your request known, and we will see that a CD is on its way to you right away. The male quartet once again, Hide Me, Rock of Ages. Storm around me rages, round me rages, 
Blessed rock of ages, hide thou me. When my journey is completed, is completed, Savior, and there's no more work to do, no work to do, O oh, blessed Savior, guide my weary spirit, weary spirit to that happy land beyond the I want to read to you four verses out of Paul's letter to Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. In these four brief verses, placed in the middle of Paul's letter of instruction to his associate on the island of Crete, Titus, we have here the whole orb or the whole scope of God's work. We have Bethlehem. We have the cross of Calvary. We have what God is doing in the believer, drawing us to himself. We have the forward look the blessed hope, that hope which energized and which caused such joy in the first century Christian's heart in spite of such incredible difficulties which they would face. And here we have what God is wanting to accomplish in us that we would be zealous for good deeds. Not good deeds in order that we might have God's approval, not in order that we might have salvation, but because we have these things, because God has lavished his mercy upon us, because of what Christ has done, he has accomplished these things, and we enter into salvation. And then naturally, most naturally, we want to say, Lord, is there anything that I can possibly do that would please you? I I am such a debtor to your grace. I am so indebted way over my head. I would want to serve you. I would want to praise you. I would want to tell others. I would want to serve others in your name and for your praise alone. Once again, Paul begins here, for the grace of God has appeared. I see in that Bethlehem. I see that appearing as the coming of Jesus Christ to be born. The grace of God had been shown repeatedly in the Old Testament, but never had the grace of God, the kindness and the mercy of God for a lost people, a people who had spit in God's face, never had there been grace such as this, a gift so great. The grace of God has appeared, Paul says, bringing salvation to all men. Christ came that he might die the death which is ours truly and rightly. But he came to bring salvation. He came to bring a better way. He came that we might not die, but that we might live in him. The next verse, verse 12. 
he instructs us to deny ungodliness, the way in which we most naturally go, ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live, Paul says, sensibly. How desperately we need that. Righteously. Righteously. Who's to determine? God is the one who determines what is right and that which is not. And Paul says, and that which is godly, even in the present age. We are not simply transported. We are not simply plucked and taken to another age in which to live. But he instructs us how that we live in the here and the now, not simply in the glory that is to come. All the while looking for the blessed hope. Oh, glorious day when Christ shall come and the clouds shall split and we shall be with him. Blessed hope. That was what energized, which brought such comfort to these people. And Paul says, blessed hope indeed when we shall see him once again. The appearing once again. He appeared in Bethlehem. He appeared in Galilee. He appeared at Calvary. He shall appear again most assuredly. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, the one who gave himself. He didn't give an angel or an archangel. He didn't give someone else of this world. He gave himself. Oh, here in that, the love of God for your lost soul, and that he desires fellowship with you, that he desires communion, that he went to the cross of Calvary and he gave himself. He gave his own body. He gave his own blood for you. What is to be your response? Oh, worship him. Oh, submit to him. Oh, surrender to him. Oh, live for him today. And let all that you do be in praise and in honor and in glory of his great name alone. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Thank you for joining Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 